Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 35 of Advanced Linear Algebra. Today we're going to talk about how to think about the singular value decomposition geometrically. Okay, so the setup here is remember that every matrix, every m by n matrix, can be thought of as a linear transformation from Fn to Fm or from Rn to Rm depending on what field you're working on. Okay, so, well, the singular value decomposition says that you can break down your matrix into a product of three matrices, so in other words, into a composition of three linear transformations. The first one's a unitary, the next one's diagonal, and the next one's some other unitary. Okay, so this gives us a nice geometric interpretation of linear transformations or matrices, right? It says that first, every linear transformation or matrix, what it does is, well, it applies V star, it rotates and or reflects the input space. Fn, okay? And then next, we, it multiplies by sigma, right? It multiplies by this diagonal matrix. So what it does is it just stretches Fn along its coordinate axes, right? It stretches in the x direction and by some amount in the y direction. It could be bigger than one, so it's a stretch. It could be less than one, so it's a shrink. But, you know, it's stretching along those coordinate axes. And all of those numbers are positive, so it's not doing any reflections in this step. Okay, but it is doing one other thing in this step. It's also embedding at that n-dimensional space into m-dimensional space, right? These matrices are linear transformations. They don't have to be square here, okay? So it might be embedding a big space down into a small space. So all I mean by that is it's taking this big space and then it's throwing away some of its dimensions. So like you can sort of picture this as like a projection, right? It's taking, for example, like three-dimensional space and then just throwing away the z direction so that you only have the two-dimensional plane on the bottom. Okay, or maybe, maybe Fm is bigger than Fn, maybe M is bigger than N, okay? In that case, what it's doing is it's taking a small space and embedding it in a larger space, which just means tacking on other dimensions, but zeros everywhere. So you can picture this as like from two to three dimensions, you'd be taking the two-dimensional xy plane and then just sort of putting it as the two-dimensional xy plane in three-dimensional space. So you still have like a z direction, but the linear transformation does nothing along it, okay? Everything's squished to zero in that direction. All right, so that's what sigma is doing, just a stretch and an embedding, okay? And then last but not least, you also have this final unitary u, and again, the intu intuition for unitaries is you're just rotating or reflecting space, but this, taste, this time you're rotating or reflecting the output space, fm, instead of fn. All right, so that's what a linear transformation looks like. It looks like a rotation and a stretch followed by another rotation. And that's it, no matter what dimension you are in, okay? So let's try to picture this in the two-dimensional case. Let's draw a picture here. And remember, the way we draw linear transformations usually is via this sort of unit square grid. So what I've drawn over here is R2, okay? And this is, you know, here's my X and Y axes. And here's just the unit square going a distance of one in each of the axes. And at the end of the day, I know after I apply a linear transformation, that square is going to be turned into some parallelogram somewhere, but, you know, if we sort of break it up into pieces, we can see a bit better what's going on here, okay? So the first step of every linear transformation is some rotation, some V star, okay? So I'm just taking that unit square grid, and here I've just rotated it sort of counterclockwise by about 45 degrees, so that unit square is now there. Okay. The next thing that every linear transformation does is it does a diagonal scaling. So it just stretches along the coordinate axes. So here I've just taken this grid here and I've squished it a tiny little bit in the x direction and then I've stretched it in the y direction. So this sort of diamond here became sort of a stretched diamond up there. Okay, now it's a parallelogram grid. Okay, and then the last thing that every linear transformation does is it does another unitary, okay? So here, what's happened is I've just taken this grid here and I've rotated it counterclockwise by a little bit more, okay? So at the end of the day, the effect of doing, you know, this whole linear transformation, this square got turned into this parallelogram, okay? So it just gives us another way of thinking about linear transformations geometrically. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to highlight something else on these pictures. Rather than just focusing on what happens to the square, it turns into a parallelogram, I'm going to also focus on what happens to the unit circle on the input space, right? So I've drawn here the circle centered at the origin with radius 1, okay? Well, after the rotation step, nothing happens to it, right? The first rotation just turns the circle. It's still a circle with radius 1 centered at the origin, so nothing happens there. But then something does happen when we do this diagonal stretch. Now the circle gets stretched into an ellipse, okay? And then finally, at the uh, in the last step, that ellipse just gets rotated, okay? So 
Look at what happens here. What are the radii of this ellipse that we get at the end of the day? Well, they're determined by this diagonal stretch, right? Okay, this diagonal stretch says, hey, we stretch in one direction by sigma one, the largest singular value, and we stretch in another direction by sigma two, uh, the second largest singular value. And if we had more dimensions, then there would be more singular values. So what's happening here is this longest axis here, that's sigma one, that's the largest singular value. And the shorter axis of the ellipse, that's sigma two, the smaller singular value. And then this is just a rotated version of that same ellipse. So the same is true, this long axis here, that's sigma one, and this short axis, that's sigma two, okay? So it's gonna be important when we're considering the singular value decomposition to consider what happens to the unit circle, not just that unit square. Okay, so let's go on from there and make a couple more notes, okay? So yeah, it's important to keep Keep in mind also how it transforms the unit circle into some ellipse, and the two radii of that ellipse are the singular values of A, okay? This is just what we said. Sigma one, the larger singular value, is the long radius of the, the ellipse, and sigma two is the short radius of that ellipse, okay? And in higher dimensions, something very similar happens, okay? All that happens is it's just that same picture, but beefed up a little bit, right? Instead of sending you the unit circle somewhere, now you're sending the unit sphere, or a unit hyper hypersphere maybe, um, into a, like a, an, an ellipsoid or a hyper ellipsoid. Okay, so if we go back to this matrix here, we, we already worked through and found a singular value decomposition of this matrix in the last lecture. Okay, so let's think about how it transforms the unit sphere. Okay, and I can't draw in 3D, so I'm not going to try. I'm just going to plop in a computer generated drawing here. All right, so over here on the left, that's the unit sphere. And what this matrix does to it is it turns it into this ellipse here. And this gray piece is just a shadow of the ellipse to try to make it easier to orient in your head. Here's the ellipse that it gets turned into. Okay, and how does this correspond to the singular value decomposition that we came up with? Well, sigma 1. Sigma one is the longest axis of that ellipse. It's the major axis, okay? It's the major, major radius, rather, okay? So sigma one, we computed that for this matrix and it was two root six. So what that means is that this distance here from the center of the, of the ellipse to the farthest away edge is that largest singular value, two root six, okay? And then the next largest radius, the, the, the second largest radius, it's, well, it's this one here. It's the one perpendicular to this one down here. We computed that to be just root six, okay? So that's the distance from the center out to this, this edge over here, okay? But this is a three by three matrix. It also has a third singular value, and we compute that third singular value to be zero. And what that corresponds to here is the fact that, you know, the third radius of this, if you think of this as like a three-dimensional hyper, or sorry, a three-dimensional ellipsoid, what is that third radius? Well, it's just zero because it's flat in the third direction, right? Okay, in other words, the output is two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. So sigma three equaling zero captures that fact that it's squished down in the third direction. Okay, so sort of these singular values, they, they capture the idea of how much the matrix is stretching the sphere in three, the three different principal directions, right? It's stretching by this amount in this direction, stretching by sigma two in that direction, and then it's stretching by a factor of zero in the third direction. It's squashing everything down so that's flat in that third direction. All right, so that's how to think about the singular value decomposition geometrically. We will go on from here in next lecture. We will talk about how this picture here relates to the fundamental matrix subspaces, okay? So what the singular value decomposition tells us about things like the range and null space of a matrix. So I will see you soon.